Assembly is an umbrella group of organisations, political parties, campaign groups, all fighting austerity, uh, all with one single purpose. Uh, and that is neatly um, summarised really by the speakers we have in front of us from uh, political parties, from campaign groups, uh, uh, um, all fighting austerity. So without further ado, I'm going to get on and introduce our first speaker, who is John Hendy QC uh, from the Institute of Employment Rights and the Campaign for Trade Union Freedom. Last week, Jeremy Corbyn said that he would repeal the Trade Union Act 19, uh, 2016 within the first 100 days of a Labour government. I want to talk to you this afternoon about the Labour laws, the laws that operate at work that the next Labour government under Jeremy Corbyn should introduce. I want to talk to you about a, a booklet that I've written with 14 other labour law experts published by the Institute of Employment uh, Rights called a Manifesto for uh, Labour Law. Now of course I appreciate that uh, many of you in the audience today are Trotskyists because 350,000 Trotskyists entered and infiltrated the Labour Party and you of course will understand that this is not a Trotskyist document. It is not a Marxist document. But let me just explain to you what is he doing. This booklet, this, uh, these set of proposals deal with all the problems that we've got at work. Zero hours contract, insecurity of employment, status of the employment relationship, hours at work, wages, uh, holiday, uh, maternity, equality, and all the rest of it. It also, of course, deals with the right to strike. They're absolutely fundamental and sacred uh, principle. It deals also with a proposal that there should be a Ministry of Labour uh, under a Labour uh, government to give a voice at the Cabinet table to working people. But I don't want to speak to you about those things. I want to speak to you about collective bargaining. Now let me just explain what collective bargaining is, because I see a number of young people in the audience who probably don't have the benefit of any collective bargaining if they are lucky enough to be in employment. And fewer people still actually recollect and have the benefit of a collective agreement which applies across the entirety of the industry in which they work, applying to all employers and all workers within that industry. Collective bargaining, of course, is having a trade union represent the working people in negotiations with the employer, backed, if necessary, by the threat of the right to uh, strike. And our proposals have at their absolute heart the restoration of collective bargaining. Because many people, even in the trade union movement, don't appreciate the catastrophe that has occurred to collective bargaining in this country. When Mrs. Thatcher came to power in 1979, 82% of British workers had the benefit of a collective agreement. 82%, eight out of every 10 workers. That percentage now has dropped to 20%. That's to say two out of every 10 of our 31.6 million working people in this country have the benefit of a collective agreement. And the rest, the rest of them, are exclusively at the mercy of their employers to dictate the terms and conditions upon which they uh, work. That is the situation that we're in. The level of collective bargaining coverage in this country today is the second lowest in Europe. Only Lithuania has got a lower rate of coverage than this country. The rate, the 
the rate of coverage of, of workers in collective, by collective agreements in this country today is lower than it was before the First World War. And if you compare that to the European standard, where we're talking an average across the European Union of 62% of workers covered by collective agreements in some countries, it's well over 90%. In Austria, for example, it's 98% of workers covered by uh, collective uh, agreements. Now, let me just explain why the reintroduction of collective bargaining, particularly at industry-wide level, is crucial to the next Labour government. And I should say that these policies and that proposition have been endorsed, I'm pleased to say, by the Labour leadership, by the Trades Union Congress, and by uh, a number of uh, our major uh, unions. Let me just explain why this is, this is so important. First reason is economic. And again, I say to the Trotskyists here, this is not Marxist economics, this is Keynesian economics, right? But it's important from an economic perspective because the economists, modern e economic research, including research by that dreaded body, the International Monetary Fund, have demonstrated that the higher the rate of collective bargaining, the more efficient the economy is. That is what explains why the German economy is so successful, or the, or the Scandinavian uh, e economies. So collective bargaining coverage is important for the e efficiency of uh, uh, an economy. It's also important from an economic perspective because those same economists have demonstrated that collective bargaining compresses inequality. And inequality of income, inequality of wealth, is of course the tragedy of the situation in which we find ourselves today. So by extending collective bargaining, you diminish uh, inequality. And the third reason is that even employers should welcome collective bargaining because it prevents undercutting on wages. It prevents a race to the lowest possible level because it fixes what the cost of labour is across an industry. And that drives employers to compete by investment in research and development, innovation uh, and, uh, and so on. So those are the economic arguments and that fits with John McDonnell's economic uh, plan. The re restoration uh, particularly of industry-wide uh, collective bargaining. But there are other reasons for collective bargaining uh, as well. Three more, which I'll tell you about briefly. The second one is worker voice. Only collective bargaining allows workers' voice to be heard at the workplace. That's the reality. It's democracy uh, at work. And if you think about things like the national minimum wage, the national living wage, the London li living wage, all very important developments, all very useful, and of course they should be increased. But the one feature about them is that no workers actually have a say in determining what the wage rates are in the national minimum wage or the national living wage. Only collective bargaining allows workers to participate in setting the terms and conditions on which they work. The third pillar of collective bargaining is social justice. In an audience like this, full of Trotskyist entryists, I don't need to make the point that the voice of the lone worker against the employer is, is or the balance of power uh, is, is unfair. Only by combining together can workers exert any power uh, against the, the uh, employer. But it has some other offshoots as well, this element of, of, um, of uh, remedying uh, the imbalance between workers and, and employers. Take that problem, which is a, uh, said to uh, have caused the, much of the vote against Brexit, the problem of immigration, the problem of foreign workers coming to this country. 
Now, there are issues of racism and xenophobia and all the rest of it. Leave, leave that aside. One of the issues, one of the facets of that problem is the fact that it's thought that the workers from abroad are coming in at lower rates and undercutting British workers. Now, if you've got a sectoral agreement across an industry, construction industry, care industry, teaching assistants or teachers, there's no undercutting because everybody is paid at the same rate. And it takes a lot of the heat out of the issue of immigration. And when the Labour Party is looking to deal with this issue of immigration, it's an easy argument to explain to working people if we've got a restoration of collective bargaining covering 90% of British workers and practically every industry, then we won't be undercut by the uh, fictional foreign workers coming in cheap. Now the fourth pillar of, and why collective bargaining is important is the reason that I got involved in this in the first place, because I'm a barrister, I've been a QC for 30 years representing trade unions. And the reason is because international law places an obligation on governments to promote collective bargaining. So when we talk about the right to collective bargaining, it's not just an expression of opinion by a few well-meaning academics or the expression of a vested interest by trade unions. It's actually a proposition of international law, international treaties which this country has signed and ratified. Convention 87 and Convention 98 of the International Labour Organization Article 11 of the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 6 of the European Social Charter, Article 28 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European uh, Union. I could give you a three hour lecture on that if you'd like, but I won't. What I'm going to end, end on, Chair, is to say this, that these ideas, these ideas are uh, not, <clears throat> these ideas are a way of convincing working people, just like in the earlier debate, reform of education is another way of convincing working people to vote uh, for Jeremy Corbyn and the next election. But the crucial thing is, we're never going to get these ideas in place unless Jeremy Corbyn and his team are elected. So let's work together for the Corbyn.